You can't just write everything that happened and expect it to be interesting. The book is created in the omissions as well. Like I could say three true things about you and they could all be negative and you could seem like a really horrible person. I could say three true things about you and they could all be positive. You'd be like the most wonderful guy. And I could say three true things about you and two could be positive and one could be negative. And you'd seem like a really complex character. And like that power is in the hands of the writer. And that's a lot of responsibility. And that's also, you know, and everyone has their own perspective and it's limited by the nature of like being a human being, being one person. And so there's just a lot to balance and weave and like to decide what do I want this book to be about? Like what are the narrative threads that I want to draw out and weave together into this tapestry and which ones kind of distract from the central pattern. Right. Welcome to the podcast tapping creativity with myself, Matthew C. Temple. And each week, we're going to dive into questions and issues and inspiration around creativity and the creative process. This week, I am joined by author Aspen Mattis, who is the best-selling author of the critically acclaimed memoir, Girl in the Woods, which was fantastic. And her second book, which was fairly recently released, Your Blue is Not My Blue, was called Fearless, a beautifully written story of inspiration, courage, and ultimate transformation by Booklist. The book was number one on Amazon bestseller and memoirs, and Deepak Chopra said the memoir will open the door to empathy, compassion, and healing, which I could just go ahead and stop there because when Deepak Chopra says that, you're kind of like, that's probably all you need to know. It's all I needed, and I could not agree more, and I'm excited to actually get into what prompted Deepak to share that particular uh, piece of insight. But further, Aspen has also worked with Ray in the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network as an advocate for trauma survivors. She's the founder and creator of the Human Network, a nonprofit 501c3 democratized think tank for peace, of which Deepak Chopra is also a part of, and he called the Human Network the fulfillment of our collective dream. So, wow, and welcome Aspen to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, this is really exciting, and I love what Deepak said about your book. I actually want to probably start with kind of how you brought that forth, because it's something that I found so beautiful was the way that in the book, it didn't come across to me as a reader that you were trying to prove anything or to posture yourself. It is a memoir, so it is about your life. And most of the time, like if I was writing my memoir, I would be, I would want to write all the great things about me and let other people, you know, talk about the less uh, sort of exciting parts of me or the less perfect parts of me, but you really brought it all forward. And I thought that calling this a real sort of picture into empathy, compassion, and healing, as well as quite honestly, courageous, uh, just makes sense. So I'm curious, because of the pieces that you brought in here, how was that to be able to just be so honest and raw? First, thank you so much. Um, I think for me, it was at first very, very scary. You know, from reading the book, I write my confessions and I wrote them from a very dark place of like feeling like I was a horrible person and I, you know, feeling like there was something wrong with me and feeling why am I the way that I am? I don't understand myself. I do so many things that are subversive and and counterintuitive. And so there must be something wrong with me. That was kind of like the place that I was writing from at that time, kind of in pain And so when I first wrote those confessions, I didn't think I would ever show them to anyone. Like I was sure that if anyone ever saw them, they would see me as like unlovable and broken and messed up. Um, And so I didn't show them to anyone for years and years and years. And then eventually I showed them to my boyfriend and he didn't like, you know, say you're the worst person ever. He was like, I should write my confessions you know, like these are very universal things, a lot of them. And um, that was really very healing to hear. And then I, I kind of realized that like, if I were to share these, like maybe other people would see that they're not the only ones who feel this way. And they would see that this is like an aspect anyway of the, the human condition. Um, right. 
Wow. So a lot of people who are listening who are aspiring to bring their own work out into the world. When you bring your work out into the world, you are opening yourself up to haters, to critique, to criticism. And when you bring something so vulnerable, it's hard for everyone because no matter whether it's a memoir or whether it is a book of poetry or whether it's even a painting, you're actually sharing your soul with your audience. Mm -hmm. And so I want to hear how that was for you to really deal with putting something so vulnerable out into the world and not always getting something so nice in return. Yeah, I mean, so I had had some experience with it by the time this book came out because five years earlier, Girl in the Woods came out and haters going to hate. And a lot of people, you know, everyone has a perspective and also like, you know, an ego and like a a view of the way things should be and how people should behave and, you know, and their values. And they think, you know, anyone who has values that are any different than their values on one level, those values are bad values because their values have to be good values. You know, that's how our minds work. So definitely like, you know, with Girl in the Woods, I read many of the one-star reviews and I, it wasn't very fruitful. Like I, I told myself as I was doing it, like, well, I'm reading to see the literary critique, like the critique of the writing and to grow and to learn. But really it was like kind of like very unhealthy self torture. <laughs> and so with uh, Your Blue is Not My Blue, for the most part, I didn't read any of the one star reviews. I'll go on Amazon when I'm feeling like when I need a boost in confidence and I'll click five, sort reviews, five star only, and I'll read those and I'll be like, okay, like my work is reaching people and resonating with them. But like I found personally, um, reading the the bad reviews is a little bit paralyzing and it makes you feel kind of shitty and it's not that healthy. And I've had people who you know friends who have had books out who have told me both sides of it. Some some say like you know reading the one star reviews like gives them sort of a certain kind of subversive energy. Like you know like people are paying enough attention. And this touched people deeply enough to elicit a real reaction. And they're upset because it's confronting to them in some way, you know, and like some, you know, some people can be very empowered by the, you know, jealousy and like, you know, hatred of others. But for me, I think I'm more sensitive and I try to insulate myself a little bit. <laughs> right. So when your blue is not my blue came out, you did not look at any of those one star reviews or did you have to go and take a little peek? So for the first like probably like few days, I looked at all the reviews because I was just excited to be getting reviews. But pretty quickly, um, yeah, I think it was actually my boyfriend's idea, Daniel's idea to not look at the the bad reviews and I would just search five star. So pretty quickly I stopped doing that. There was one night um where I realized I'd never realized that the audiobook also had its own reviews and I, I didn't it didn't have like a filtering mechanism or at least I didn't figure out how to do it to just see the the five star reviews. And so I like probably spent like a good two hours on the couch scrolling through, you know, one star review after two star review after one star review after three star review and just not feeling that great. And then I yeah. was like, this is not productive. But I've, I've also seen those. I'm actually very, like, impressed by the people. I actually would love to make one of these, but I think it would take a lot of courage, and I'm not sure if I'm there yet. I've seen the YouTube videos where actors, writers, all kinds of people will, or musicians will, like, you know, it's kind of like the mean tweets. Like, they'll read, like, nasty, mean, vitriolic things people have written about them and to them, like, really horrible things about, like, their appearance, they're like, you know, they should die, they should commit suicide, like, hope you get cancer, like, awful things that, like, say so much more about the person writing the comment than the person receiving it, but, like, just kind of making a compilation of those and, like, kind of, like, recognizing how ridiculous they are seems really empowering, and I, I might do that someday. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how funny it would be, but... So there are two parts that I actually want to plumb a little bit. The first part is... 
once you've brought work out into the world, it's very, it's all very public. But before you have, or for people who are also earlier in their stages of their creative career, there's the imagination of that, or there's the disapproval from parents or the doubt from friends or whatever. And I think there's a lot of similarity to that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There are like voices telling you that you should do something other than what feels right to you. Yeah. Whatever that be. So uh, my first book is about I hiked from Mexico to Canada. And when I told people that I was going to do that, pretty much universally, they were like, that sounds dangerous. That sounds like not a good idea. Why would you subject yourself to that? That sounds like, a, you know, a terrible idea for one reason or another. Most people reacted that way. And it was like the best thing I could have done for myself. And I knew that. And it's kind of like you have to you have to let yourself know what you already know and trust yourself. And really tune into that like inner knowing um, because no one else knows what's right for you. And if you don't live your first choice life, the person who's going to suffer from that the most is you. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that's really important because there is always that. And I think, you know, once again, there are two sides to that. Sometimes like there's actually something to learn from it. And other times one of the things to learn from it is, you know what, uh, if you don't like this, then I'm not doing it for you. Right. And for you as someone who is a, you know, is a rape survivor that for you, it's like somebody who's going to come and crap on your work. You just didn't do it for them. Right. And, and so, and that's a sort of a big one. And the other one is someone who's making their first short film or write, or decide I'm going to write a blog about X, Y, or Z or whatever. Some people are going to show up and they're going to hate that. And it's like, you know what? That like, my, as my mother said, that's why Baskin Robbins made 31 flavors, right? It's totally fine. Yeah. You, you can hate this. It's just not for you. Yeah. And I think on another level, the people who are like ambivalent toward it are like, you know, I should really say like apathetic mm -hmm. toward it. It's really not for them, but the people who hate it, it might be for them because it's eliciting like a really strong reaction and it might be like, you know, striking a deep chord that makes them very uncomfortable and confronting them in some way about some way in their life where they've been, you know, playing it safe or like there's a big theme in Your Blue Is Not My Blue about playing victim. And, you know, it might be um, illuminating to them the ways in which they've played victim in their lives and they don't want to see that. And so they have to condemn the book and kill the book so that they don't have to re like re-see their life, you know, which is so much harder. I, and I think that you're onto something too. I'm working with a client whose father has not been terribly supportive of, you know, of her work. It's been really difficult for her when it comes from a parent or also from the outside, you have two different things you have on one side, you have somebody who like, I wanted to do something like that. I wanted to make other choices in my life and I didn't. And therefore they have a little bit of resentment. And sometimes also even coming from parents is I want you to succeed so bad and that I'm going to over criticize because somehow my criticism is going to be beneficial to your process. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I, I feel like those things can actually really, it, like what you just said is really important to recognize like what is it in the other person? You know, what are they missing? What did they wish that they had done? What regrets do they have? What is their story that's bringing them to this place? Yeah, yeah. Something my dad has said to me about himself, like just for context, is like parents are inherently conservative about their kids. Like they want them to survive. That's like the base thing that they want. They want them to like have enough money, enough food. And like taking a huge risk and going into a, a, a career that isn't a career, like something with no guarantees, like the creative arts is like kind of like most parents' nightmare. Um, even if they'll ultimately be blown away by what you achieve. And um, even if like their higher self is so proud of you, you know. Exactly. I think the other thing I wanted to come back to in this conversation about like one star reviews or crappy reviews, I pre-purchased Your Blue Is Not My Blue. So the day that it was released, my copy hit my Kindle. I didn't read it right away. It, you know, it took me a few weeks or whatever to, before I got around to it. And when I did, I went and, you know, it popped up with reviews. And since I know you, I went through and I looked and I shared this with you before was the critique of your, of, of your work in some ways. And like things that people said that seemed vitriolic was like, wait, that's exactly what I loved about your book. Like several of those early comments. And, and I, I, I th it's important to mention because someone was like, oh, she seems like a whiny brat or something like that. And I was, and I thought, 
you know, is she and someone like she's not likable or something. And I thought that's what I loved about the book is you weren't trying to be like, hey, yay, I'm Aspen. I've gone through the valleys of darkness or whatever. And I've come through and here, look how great I am. You were just like, I'm a imperfect, flawed human being still trying to figure this thing out. And that was so refreshing. Thank you. I think it's really important. And I wanted I share that with you, but also for for other creatives is that sometimes what other people hate about it may actually be the exact same thing that is what makes it worthwhile. You know? Thank you. Yeah. And I think that like people who are creative tend to be more like, oh my God, that was so brave to tell the truth. But people who have never done it, to them, it's like extremely threatening because it's like if I were to expose myself and to say all the things that I've worked so hard to keep hid hidden and obscured, then I'm sure my world would crumble. And so I have to reject someone doing that because them doing that threatens the solidity of this life I've constructed. So totally. it's like kind of like the, the creative people tended to be more like amen and the people who, you know, reject the, I think everyone's creative, but the people who have like repressed the creative aspects of themselves are the ones who are like, you can't do that. That's wrong. That's bad. Like cancel it. <laughs> totally. It is so vulnerable. And I, and, and I'm kind of hammering on that a little bit because I think it's so vital to recognize that the creative process is so, whatever you're creating is so revealing. And if it's not vulnerable and it's not revealing, it's probably not creative and you're probably not pushing your boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, no wonder when people are starting out, it's so intimidating. And I think to that, I want to kind of move into that because one of the things that you talked about in Your Blue is Not My Blue was you, you went into the process of writing Girl in the Woods a bit in your second book. From the outside, very often it can seem like, oh, wow, Aspen's written two books. They've been on bestseller lists. Like, that's so amazing. She's so lucky or she just can sit down and do it or whatever. And you reveal in, in Your Blue is Not My Blue that it really wasn't just like, hey, I'm Aspen. I'm brilliant. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to write this kick-ass book and I'm going to you know, get a publisher and I'm going to go on a book tour. It wasn't like that. <laughs> yeah. So I thought that writing the book would take about seven months and it took two and a half years to write Girl in the Woods. And so I got the book deal on Valentine's Day and the book was due, I think, I think in September. So however many months that is, like eight months later or something like that. Um, and I thought that would be plenty of time. Like, how long could it possibly take to write a book? Like, a page a day is a book a year, you know, and I'm going to write two pages a day. So six months, perfect, you know. And that was not the case. <laughs> First, I discovered, you know, structuring a book is a tremendously difficult thing, especially um, doing it for the first time. And then it's even harder when it's your life. So you're confined by the boundaries of reality. And, you know, life is not necessarily structured like a movie or like a book. You have to actually, um, it's like um, my mentor always says, Sue so Shapiro, she always says, like, if you got the story, tell it. If you ain't got it, write it. And really, you've got to write the story of your life. Like, you can't just write everything that happened and expect it to be interesting. You know, the book is created in, in the omissions as well. Like, I could say three true things about you, and they could all be negative, and you could seem like a really horrible person. And I could say three true things about you, and they could all be positive. And you'd say, like, the most wonderful guy. And I could say three true things about you and two could be positive and one could be negative and you'd seem like a really complex character and like that power is in the hands of the writer and that's a lot of responsibility and that's also you know and everyone has their own perspective and it's limited by the nature of like being a human being being one person and so there's just a lot to balance and weave and like to decide what do I want this book to be about? Like, what are the narrative threads that I want to draw out and weave together into this tapestry and which ones kind of distract from the central pattern right. and themes. And so, yeah, it was a lot harder than I expected it to be. Writing a book is really hard, at least for me. <laughs> and, you know, it's definitely my first time. And, and then also the subject matter, like writing about sexual assault, writing about just kind of like traumatic and difficult experiences I'd had was painful because to really write about it effectively, you have to kind of in a way re relive it and you know, go back to the, the smell of 
his skin or like the you know the music that was playing and it's really emotional um mm. and yeah it took half years so i had a lot of extensions and i almost thought i was going to lose the book deal at one point Right. And I think that that's kind of important too, is that, right. You, you had a book deal and by the skin of your teeth, you kept the book deal two and a half years later. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a cliche, but like, you know, a door could open for you, but then you still have to walk through the door. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That was your, your first book. And I think that that's so important because everybody who's writing or creating, usually we have some semblance of how to do it. Right. Like I know how to write, so I should be able to write a book. I know I've seen movies and I can I can tell people a funny story. So I must be able to do stand up comedy or or write a movie or whatever. And, and that's just not the case. It's this process to go is is going through. But then you uh, eventually wrote a second book. And by the time you from like when you started uh, your blue is not my blue until you finished it. How long did that take in comparison? And what, what how did the process shift between your first and second book? Well, the second book was a lot more efficient, definitely. It was a lot less time. But really, the the process of writing the second book started long before I I sold it because um, I sold it on proposal, and I sold it. It was a very long proposal. I think it was like 187 pages, and 100 of those at least were sample pages. Um, So I'd written, you know, about 100 pages of the book before I sold the book. But let's see. I sold it in October of 2018, and it came out in June of 2020. So it took about a year to write after the book deal mm-hmm. and probably about six months before the book deal, so maybe like a year and a half. And so what shifted as far as your perspective or your process between this like you know really young woman in New York, like, hey, I'm going to write a book, to like, and not knowing what in the world you're doing, really, like probably thinking that you knew more than you did to then the more mature woman who sits down several years later to do this again. Well, one very huge difference was I had a very hand on editor who lived with me, who is my boyfriend. So that really helped. Like he'd be like, don't waste your time. This doesn't belong in the book. Like I could have spent like a week writing about something that didn't belong in the book easily because it was interesting to me. Like I had, I think... And this is an example of a time where I did it, even though he said, don't do it. Like, I think I had like 15 pages about Occupy Wall Street that had nothing to do with the book. But I was like very interested in Occupy Wall Street. Um, But it didn't belong in your blue is not my blue. So I did write those pages and it was kind of a waste of time, but also fun and interesting. (laughs) And but like there were tons of times I did that, but I didn't have someone telling me, don't do that, um, with, with Girl in the Woods and Girl in the Woods, I should say the first draft of Girl in the Woods or not the first official draft, but like when it was at its, its longest, it was 1300 pages and the book was about 400 pages. So I had to write a lot of writing to get to the place that was actually the beginning. And like, I had to do a lot of work that didn't that you know, needed to be cut because it was like the place to get to the real good stuff that it belonged. So there was a lot. I mean, your blue is not my blue at its longest was probably less than 400 pages. Definitely. So, um, and I don't know, it came to like 300 pages or something like that. So like I did a lot less writing for your blue is not my blue as well. Um, and I worked a lot fewer hours, like grow in the woods. I would frequently have like, 11, 12, 13 hour days that weren't that productive. Like I would spend all day at my computer kind of like banging my head against the wall essentially or writing and then deleting or writing something that didn't belong and realizing it didn't belong and having to write it in order to discover that it didn't belong. Like I didn't have the zoomed out clarity um, that having another set of eyes with Daniel but also that experience has given me. Um, So yeah, I'd say... Um, having like an editor helping me like full time was very helpful. I mean, obviously at the publish publishing house, I also had an editor for your blues and blue and an editor for girl in the woods, but they're not like as hands-on as like someone who lives with you and, and they're not necessarily, you know, as familiar with your voice or, you know, on the same page, you know, with, with your blues, not my blue. I had an amazing editor, um, who was definitely on the same page, but, 
um, for Girl in the Woods, my editor and I were on very different pages as well. So that was another source of distress. <laughs> so even like that being a source of distress and writing 1300 pages that became 400 pages and, you know, a seven month book deal that turns into two and a half years that you almost lose in the moment it was probably harrowing, I can only imagine, right? Of like self-doubt, self-deprecation, all these things, right? Yeah, it was very stressful. It was like, I felt like, like my dream came true and I was it was going to slip through my fingers and disappear. Like, and at any moment, and then like the reality is like, if you choke on your first book deal, you don't get a second book deal. So it was like, it felt like my whole career was at stake and I felt very overwhelmed. And like, I, I like anything that I was doing that wasn't working on my book was was a waste of time. Like I didn't allow myself to enjoy life during that time um, in a way that was healthy. Whereas with Your Blue is Not Your Blue, like I I certainly worked a lot, but I traveled the world and, you know, took lots of long walks and hung out with my family. And, you know, it was not nearly as stressful. You did something else that I know that you've been working on a novel and you mentioned that was kind of what you had hoped you would be like. You wanted to be a novelist. Am I remembering this correctly? Yeah, great memory. And so that being the case, you wanted to be a novelist. You go off to college. You, in in your first, uh, for those who haven't read either of your books or know much about you, um, you're raped in the first couple weeks of college and it ends up just kind of taking you down this path that results in leaving school and wa- basically going on a 2,600-ish mile walk in order to really find your authenticity, to find find Aspen again. And I'll just say, as we all know, that in many ways you found Aspen and in many ways that was just the very beginning to now a life that gets to be continuing to discover Aspen and uncover. But I th- one of the things that struck me is that you had these these visions and dreams and goals. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to become a, a novelist. And then you were derailed. And then you wrote this memoir and you know, you've had quite a a bit of success with that. And then you've written yet another memoir. You have, you know, short form pieces you've written for, I think, The New Yorker and The Times and, uh, and, and other publications. So there's all of these other things that, that go along with it, with it. And only now, recently, after two memoirs, other articles, interviews, uh, a derailed collegiate career, are you now working on a novel and I just want to hear hear something about that because because it's so easy to become discouraged when I'm going off to college and somebody does something terrible and now that's derailed. And then I really want to be a novelist, but these other things. And now after, you know, at after years and years, you're finally able to come back. And so I'm just kind of hear, curious to hear a little bit of that process for you because I think it's just so valuable. It's certainly, I'm not sure how wise I'll be on this subject because it's sort of like one of those things like whatever happens to you inevitably leads to the next thing and never leads to the next thing. And I think like the power that you have is at every juncture to kind of either kind of curl up in a ball, especially if it's something hard, like and kind of give up and, you know, forsake whatever your true dream is or to, for lack of like a better word, like adapt and like let your your intuition still be the guide. I think resilience is really like born from a trust that everything will eventually be okay. It's like the least profound thing ever, but like something that I often just repeat in my head is like everything will work out nicely because it always has. Like it, in, on one level, like, you know, it might not be the way that I think I want it to, right now but ultimately um you know like some of the worst things in my life have led to some of the best things in my life and i certainly would never have written a memoir had i not been raped on my second night of college like and i certainly would never have gotten an agent had i not been raped in in that way maybe a different way but like this was my path and so i have to choose it or else I'd be like fighting against reality on some level, which doesn't really work. Right. Um, and I think that there's something to that in the creative process as well. You know, I want to be a filmmaker and I end up writing books or I end up doing blogs, whatever those things are, right? You wanted to be a novelist and 
and then you write this memoir and it's like sometimes it's circuitous, right? Oh, you're, you're coming back to that. And obviously you've been working on a novel. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going, it's going to be sold or published and you might have to write four <laughs> or five novels before you get one published and you might be able to publish your first one, but it might not be till the third one until anybody even gives two hoots about a novel by Aspen Mattis. Right. Just kind of like being aware that in what ways do we engage as creatives and be really curious with where is this taking me? Because I would say probably you and I both have at this point in our in our careers, we can look back a little bit and say, oh, now I see the value of that or, or how that played out into my life as a positive. But we both also know there were times in our lives where it didn't seem that way at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like the, that speech that Steve Jobs gave about how the dots will connect from the future looking back. And that's the only way that the dots connect and just trusting that the dots always connect from the future looking back. Um, Exactly. I think that speech should be a required viewing for most people. Well, you know, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, come out and share some of your insight, your story, your wisdom, the uh, creative pieces that you have gleaned along the way. So as you're moving forward and from all these just kind of in closing, as you kind of like look back, what are some of the sort of key tools that you have taken along the way that as a creative really benefit you now um, and help you to be able to continue to pursue your work as a creative person? So, I mean, I guess I could answer this question very literally, which is my like inclination. So I'll just do that and tell me if you meant like more metaphorically. <laughs> but I think like one tool that um, I discovered like a few years ago that really, really has kind of liberated me in terms of like enjoying my days more fully is um, I call it sessions. So I set like essentially a 45 minute timer on my phone. And during those 45 minutes, I can't like go on the internet. I can't check Facebook or, you know, Instagram or anything like that. And I can only write and just keep writing or editing if I'm in the editing process. Um, but I have to be working on my project for that 45 minute session. And so now I, I, I know days by like the number of sessions I did it like, Oh, that was a five session day, or that was a seven session day, or that was a two session day. And whenever you're not doing a session, it completely takes the pressure off of your project. Like, so I'm not like, Oh, I'm, like I should, like I'm sort of working on it or I should be working on it. Like often like ideas will come to me, not during a session, but it's because I'm like taking a walk or playing soccer with my nephew or, you know, watching a movie or, you know, something totally unrelated to my project. And it kind of almost like makes the days more expansive and open and free because there isn't this like sense in my gut, like I should be working on my project. It's like, no, I did three sessions this morning and I might do two more tonight. And, you know, that's perfect. You know, and I sometimes have gone through phases where I keep track of the number of sessions I'm doing, like, you know, per day. Um, and other times not, and it could be good either way, but sometimes you have like, you know, a week where you have nothing you have to do or, you know, or fewer responsibilities. And it's like, let's make this like a super session week. Let's make this like 55 sessions this week or something like that. And so, yeah, sessions have been very freeing, just a 45 minute timer because it's very manageable. And at the end of it, you can easily just start another one or you could not. I'm, I love it. I'm a big fan. I incorporate that in a slightly different way, but um, I think that's really, really valuable. So thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much for sharing your time with with me, the audience for Tapping Creativity. And uh, for anyone who is watching and or listening, if you have not read either Girl in the Woods or Your Blue is Not My Blue, highly recommended. They are available anywhere where you buy books or ebooks or audiobooks or rent ebooks or audiobooks however you you do uh, it's really worthwhile beautiful stories and now that you know a little bit of aspen you will have a connection into her world that uh, you otherwise wouldn't so uh, thanks again for joining us everybody and i'll see you next week thank you so much